politics and above religion, a moral authority exists known globally as the ageless wisdom. It is the study of consciousness, the mystery of awareness, which cannot be measured, yet will not be denied. Stay tuned as we explore consciousness, the fundamental nature of reality. Welcome to the Ageless Wisdom Mystery School with Michael Banner. Hello, and thanks for joining us for today's episode of the Ageless Wisdom Mystery School on 90.7 FM, KPFK, live streaming for the world, and of course, podcast on all platforms. It is a pleasure, again, to join you, and uh, gosh, we really appreciate that you take the time to tune in, whether live or on demand after the fact. In my opening remarks today, I want to talk about the nature of this program, the Ageless Wisdom Mystery School, and reiterate our basic premise, our our mission statement, if you will, that while it appears often to be about politics or even religion, or some other current issue, some newsworthy event or circumstance, it's really about more than politics and religion and news. This is a program about consciousness, that is to say, about awareness, about noticing what we notice, and the very foundational concept of existence. What could be more existential than awareness? For without it, nothing could exist. All things depend on our awareness of them. Now, if we break it down from there, we can say, well, The emphasis is really on psychology and philosophy. And that too covers a large scope of ideas, many of which religion and politics try to corner. It's odd to me that we increasingly, it seems, expect government at some level to solve our problems. Or maybe we hold government responsible for the fact the problem even exists. And similarly, organized religion seems to do everything that it can to monopolize, as if by stranglehold, everything having to do with ethics and morality. And it's dangerous to limit our understanding of things to institutions. Even education must, by its very nature, go far beyond academia. What we learn in books and what the universities and colleges offer us. The role of journalism, and this includes broadcasting in a democracy, is to promote free speech, a free exchange of ideas without fear of retribution or punishment. And that's part of what I've always done and what I'm committed to here every Tuesday afternoon at 1 o'clock with this radio program, The Ageless Wisdom Mystery School. Another important way of talking about our scope of issues and our range of topics is personal and transpersonal development. Actually, I like these phrases a lot. Personal and transpersonal development is actually our topic today. We're going to feature a guest, a young man, barely in his 30s, who has already devoted his life to this field, personal and transpersonal development. He calls himself a transformational speaker. And I'll bring him on in a few minutes. I'd like to begin today, however, by quoting a passage that one of my listeners recently brought to my attention. And it's from the writings of a very well-known philosopher, a 17th century Dutch philosopher, a so-called rationalist, thought of in the same way we consider Leibniz and Descartes to be rationalists. And that's Baruch Spinoza. Spinoza was a heretic. He was a Dutch Jew who was, at the early age of 23, excommunicated by his synagogue for his evil and wicked ways. The Declaration of Excommunication you can find in Wikipedia. If you want to look it up, it's sort of humorous. But Spinoza, even though he was attacked once on the steps of the synagogue by a knife-wielding zealot and rather shaken, 
behind the whole affair. He wore that torn cloak for years afterward as a kind of a souvenir or a way of reminding himself, <laughs> if no one else, of the dangers of being a religious heretic, but a great philosopher. In many ways, Baruch Spinoza is the philosopher's philosopher and one of the progenitors of the Age of Reason, the Age of Enlightenment, so-called, was filled with ideas that were seeded by Spinoza. I think of Spinoza as a rationalist mystic. And if you wonder what mysticism is about, it's really the liberal or progressive extension of religion into secular or humanist philosophy. Mysticism is the personal experience of the search for divinity in the cosmos, the natural world, in nature, in all things. The personal experience, in other words, without dogma, without ritual, without ceremony. And so it can be rather a, a lonely search. Mystics do talk to each other. They get together, but not in an organized or institutional fashion. In this brief little essay that was brought to my attention, I'm going to share with you here. It'll take me just a little more than four minutes to read, and then we'll do a short break and come back with my guest for today as we talk about personal transformation, personal and transpersonal development in the context of the progressive mission of KPFK and people who are longing for peace and social justice, but frustrated when government or corporations or other institutions fail to come over the hill like the cavalry in a black and white movie and save the day. That's not going to happen. Institutions are not going to save us from the corruption of institutions, whether they're churches or schools or boarding events or government or multinational corporations. It's not going to happen. It has to be a groundswell, a most democratic movement of enlightened women and men changing the world one individual at a time. Not according to any particular policy, but as a result of a refinement of character, a greater understanding, a more refined code of morals and ethics that dwells within each and every one of us as conscience. Are there people with no conscience? Of course. Generally, sociopaths or psychopaths are identified as such largely because of their lack of conscience. It's what many people in the right-wing base of our former president found so admirable about him, his complete and total embrace of indecency and immorality. What did they say? Uh, He... Speaks his mind. That's why they like that. <laughs> That's why they liked the Tangerine Man. He's not afraid to say what he thinks. Yeah, but what he thinks is indecent and immoral. It's psychopathic. It's narcissistic. So the only antidote for that is better mental health, really, and the idea of refining or or transforming, or some might say. Self-realization, the true self, not the egoic little minds of men and women. Not the ego self, but a higher sense of self. So again, this is from the 1600s, 400 years ago, sort of hard to believe. Baruch Spinoza speaking as if he knew God. I think you're going to like this. Listen up. I don't know if God actually spoke, but if he did, here's what I think he would say to the believer. Stop praying and kicking yourself in the chest. What I want you to do is go out into the world and enjoy your life. I want you to have fun, sing and relax. Enjoy everything I've done for you. Stop going to those dark, cold temples you built yourself and say it's my house. My house is in the mountains, in the woods, rivers, and lakes. 
This is where I live with you and express my love for you. Stop accusing me of your miserable life. I never told you there was anything wrong in you, that you were a sinner, that your sexuality or joy was a bad thing. So don't blame me for everything they told you to believe. Stop rehashing sacred readings that have nothing to do with me. If you can't read me at dawn, in a landscape, in the eyes of your friend, your wife, your man, in your son's eyes, you won't find me in a book. Stop being scared. I don't judge you. I don't criticize you. I don't come home angry, and I don't punish. I am pure love. I've filled you with passions, limitations, pleasures, feelings, needs, inconsistencies, and I gave you free will. How can I blame you if you answer something I put in you? How can I punish you for being who you are if I am the one who made you? Do you really think I could create a place to burn all my kids who behave badly for the rest of eternity? What kind of God can do this? If I were like this, I would not deserve to be respected. If I just wanted to be revered, I would have filled the world with dogs. Respect your fellow people and don't do what you don't want for yourself. All I'm asking is that you pay attention to your life. Let your free will be your guide. You and nature will have a single body. So don't believe you have power over it. You are part of her. Take care of her, and she'll take care of you. I put in you and made everything good for you and made it difficult to access what is not. Don't put your genius in looking for what's bad for this balance. It's up to you to keep this balance intact. Nature knows how to keep it. Just don't trouble it. I made you absolutely free, free to create a paradise or a hell in your life. I can't tell you if there's anything after this life, but I can give you some advice. Stop believing in me this way. Believing is guessing and guessing and guessing. I don't want you to believe in me. I want you to feel me in you. May you feel me when you take care of your sheep, when you pet your dog, when you touch your little girl, when you fall in the river. Express your joy and get used to taking just what you need. The only thing for sure is that you are here, that you're alive, that this world is full of wonders, and in all these wonders you are able to know exactly what you really need. Don't look for me outside. You won't find me. I'm here. Nature. The cosmos. It's me. This is KPFK. Welcome, Dr. Bradley Nelson. Thank you for joining me. When you do the um, emotion code and when you do the muscle testing, when you say you test people, how do you get to the emotion that fast? How do you do a process of elimination? What we do is we use a chart called the emotion code chart. There are 60 emotions in the chart. And so we have to get information somehow from the subconscious because our emotional baggage is not consciously known. But it is known to the subconscious mind, which is the vast bulk of our intelligence. That's the part of us that, of course, is uh, keeping everything running in our bodies. And it's, uh, it's aware of everything that we've ever done, every face you've ever seen in the crowd, and so on. It's all logged in there. The Aware Show with Lisa Gar, Wednesday and Thursday afternoons at 1. This is KPFK. And we're back. You're listening to the Ageless Wisdom Mystery School on 90.7 FM. KPFK for all of Southern California. Hey, thanks for joining us. Uh, hope you make it a habit to listen every Tuesday afternoon at 1 o'clock for the Mystery School. I've got a uh, really interesting guest, someone recommended to me by one of our KPFK listeners. She loves reading Science of Mind magazine and 
she actually sent me a clip of an article that uh, was written by our guest today. And so I checked them out, as one does, on the uh, Google machine, and we managed to hook up. And lo and behold, he used to live in Los Angeles, and we're talking to him now from the great state of Georgia. And I'm happy to have him with us. He's a transformational speaker. Though a young fella, he's very, very devoted and dedicated to personal and spiritual development. And I've enjoyed chatting with him, though briefly till now. And I think you'll enjoy listening to my guest, Jeffon Seeley. Jeffon, good afternoon and welcome to KPFK. Thank you so much, Michael. I've, uh, I've been a longtime listener of KPFK and it's uh it's so unique the way in which things uh, doorways of opportunity open up and now I can uh, share some of my voice or or perspective. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Oh, you're very welcome. Nice to have you inside the radio here with us. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you've just moved to Georgia. Are you enjoying yourself down there? Yeah, interestingly enough, you know, we lived in uh right outside of Riverside in the Redlands area. And uh, my first couple days here in Georgia, I think I, I saw more rain uh, than I did in my two two plus years <laughs> in Southern California. But it's green, it's nice, a um, little bit different change of culture, but I'm welcoming the change. Well, it's a beautiful state. America's so diverse. And if you travel around this country, there's truly so much to see. I was impressed in my, what do I say, explorations of who you are and what you're up to with your interest in these topics of personal and spiritual development and your story about how that came about as a young man, initially, as many of us do, casting about finding that maybe religion or the traditional worldview of consumerism wasn't really working for you. Uh, I'd like to hear a little of that story of... What about metaphysics and mysticism and consciousness? And I know you often quote these uh, success and prosperity teachers and, you know, the classics, uh, Napoleon Hill and Dale Carnegie and Norman Vincent Peale, as well as the more spiritual Ernest Holmes and and uh, William James and on and on. You're well-versed in the classics. How, how did you come to all of this as a young man? That is a, a really, really great question. Um, I think that it has to all start with uh, the experience that I was brought into. Um, I often just kind of reflect and think, was there a time before I was able to take my first breath on this planet where I had this idea or at least inclination as to where I would land on this, this earth that we call home? And uh, my unique journey uh, began in the really, really beautiful state uh, of, of Utah, uh, specifically Salt Lake City. Uh, my mother was adopted from Scotland. So in meditations and things of that sort, I would often reflect on how my grandparents, who were a part of the Mormon uh, tradition there in Utah, uh, my grandmother unable to have a children of her own, and my grandfather, a, a carpenter, uh, was they were sent to a building mission there in the U.K., and something must have drew them to this specific orphanage where my mother was. And I often just think of the, the synchronicities that aligned with such precision to enable her to be the child that they ended up adopting and brought back to uh, Salt Lake City. And with the hopes that as she got older, she would have more opportunities and or as she had children of her own, so too would they have opportunities. And so there's all of these synchronicities uh, that were brought about prior to me even just simply taking my first breath. And on the flip side of that, my father is African-American, uh, completely different upbringing than my mother. Uh, my grandparents on my father's side, my grandma born in Jackson, Mississippi. We can only imagine the experience and circumstances that she went through and, and my, my, my great-grandparents and on and on throughout the, the history there. And my grandfather born in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, African-American as well. And just hearing the various stories of my grandparents, uh, their upbringing, one of them being raised in central Utah, uh, you know, part of that Mormon uh, pioneer story. And then on my father's side, my grandpa telling stories about eight, nine years old uh, being shot at with shotguns because he was too close to somebody's farm. 
Uh, so very different experiences. But nevertheless, it allowed me to be brought into this experience, this life. Uh, in Salt Lake City, my father and I didn't necessarily have a great relationship until I was out of high school. My mother, at a young age, uh, when I was young, she started struggling with many things that individuals struggle with, um, drugs, uh, addiction. As I often say, she failed to, to recognize the light that my sisters and I saw shining within her. And that just sent her on a very slippery slope for about two and a half decades. Um, and that meant that I was raised with my grandparents on my mother's side in a very nice area of Salt Lake City. And it didn't take long to look out into the community and recognize that things didn't really match up in terms of my sister and I, two of the only kids who had a slight different complexion of skin. Uh, my grandparents raising us off a, a very small social security. So we didn't have the, the, the things that everybody else in the community had. Though I will say that we were blessed nevertheless. Um, and so all of these things kind of compounded and I started looking out into the, the community. Uh, my grandmother brought us to the Mormon church and there was just something that I felt was missing. It's, it's as if I was sitting in Sunday school and they were teaching these specific lessons that always seem to exclude people that look like me. <laughs> I, I never saw a picture of a, a black or even biracial angel on any of the, the hallways in the, the church or the temple. I never heard teachings about people that reflected me, though, interestingly enough, the story of Jesus begins in Egypt, Africa, <laughs> but yet there were no, no people that, that were, had that tint of skins. And I, I always felt as if there was something missing. It's like, I felt as if I was drawn to read between the lines. And there was a circumstance that happened, perhaps not unique to me, but something that was specific to me. Uh, my grandmother as a librarian at the Mormon church on a Sunday, it meant we could leave sacrament meetings early. For those of you who don't know, sacrament meetings in the Mormon uh, tradition, you sit and you listen to people talk. You, you're, you're taught to be very reverent. You don't clap. You don't applaud. You just sit, sit back and listen. Uh, we were able to leave sacrament early because my grandmother was a librarian. That was the highlight. Trust me. I mean, I was able to get out of there, go to the library, <laughs> maybe draw a little bit, you know. Praise God. Yeah. I, I get to leave. <laughs> yeah. That also uh, meant that I was one of the first ones in, in Sunday school. Um, one day I was about 12 or so, maybe 11 or 12. And I walked into the Sunday school classroom and very large on the chalkboard were some words that I, I, I won't forget. And I've, I've heard them in the past, but it said no N words. I think you know what, what, what I'm getting at allowed. Now there were only two people of color in our church, myself and my little sister. Not knowing what to do, I went and uh, told my grandmother, who she was a, a white woman. She came back and saw the, that derogatory statement blatantly on the, the chalkboard. And we went and had a conversation with the bishop. Interestingly enough, they knew exactly who did it. There was never anything done to that individual who wrote that uh, statement on the chalkboard. And um, my grandma, I think, really for the first time in her life, had a personal experience of uh, racial discrimination. Um, though it wasn't directly impacting her, it was impacting somebody that was very close to her. And she gave me an opportunity if I wanted to go or not. And so I chose not to go to, to Mormon church anymore. But there was always something that stuck with me in terms of leaning towards some of the, the main scriptures. I mean, the first line in the scripture, in the beginning, God created so if in the beginning God created, then how could there be anything opposite of that which the divine has created? And these were the ideas that kind of stuck with me uh, through high school, though not really at the forefront of my consciousness, and into college when I left Salt Lake to go to Seattle. And uh, in Seattle, my father had this uh, spiritual friend, and I'm, I'm doing air quotes because uh, I think I now am one of those spiritual friends to many of my acquaintances. And maybe you are one of those spiritual friends uh, as well. But this is an individual that will say these unique sayings like um, divine order is everywhere present or there's no spot where God is not or everything is working out for the highest and best. And I remember having these heated debates with him about why all these things that he was saying were just complete nonsense and garbage. Um, I pointed at things like my grandmother who recently passed. Uh, my mother, who was on her way to another relapse, 
uh, my sisters who were still in Salt Lake City with nobody around them to really uh, remind them of the uniqueness and the, the beauty that was dwelling within them. And I thought I made a, a really, really great point as to why everything that he was saying was complete nonsense. And uh, he ended up giving me a book. And, you know, books are quite powerful, Michael. If we give ourselves permission to open that book, which is a miraculous act in itself, and then start reading the lines or those words in the book, um, it can really be transformational. And after a few months of staring at that book on the shelf, I decided, uh, let me just open it up and see. And it was a book that I'm sure many of the listeners may have heard of, um, a book that really resonated with me and just really spoke to something deep within my my conscious, my being. And it, the book is entitled A Course in Miracles. And the first line that I read, I will never forget. And it seemed to open this doorway within my mind that took me on this path that felt like home. And uh, that line was simply, the real cannot be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. And I was thinking, what is the real? Not the lowercase R-E-A-L, but the capital R-E-A-L. And from my perspective, that seems to be the infinite essence and energy that enables us to simply be. It is that which is enabling our atoms to thrive. It is dividing ourselves. It is enabling our, our lungs to breathe, our heart to beat, our minds to think, the earth to spin, the sun to shine, on and on and on. It seems to be this golden thread. That is the real. There was nothing outside of that. Hence, the first line in the Bible that I mentioned, in the beginning, God created from that perspective, at least the connection that it, that was made in my mind, is that real that is, there is nothing outside of that. And if I am able to connect to that or be aware of that, be mindful of that, see it in other people, see it in all of my experiences, then it seems as if it opens up this infinite doorway where peace is able to flow. So that was the trajectory or the springboards that allowed me to catapult on this journey that I am on. And um, we all have it. It's all unique to, to all of us, but it's something that really resonated with me. You know, Jafan, many people think of, uh, and I, I guess it's more of a reflex than anything well thought out, that science and religion or spirituality are like polar opposites. They conflict. And increasingly, many of us are seeing them come together. Not that spiritual principles are morphing or changing, but Science seems to be giving us an opportunity to look with new eyes and and maybe listen in new ways to these ancient spiritual concepts in all religions, that which uh, transcends organized religion but is found connecting all spiritual and uh, many philosophical traditions. I heard a, uh, a YouTube presentation just recently where the speaker used the word evidential mysticism, evidential or evidentiary, like what is the evidence that mystical concepts are real, that they're grounded? What He, he, he also defined reality as that which persists even when we don't believe in it, <laughs> which yeah. I thought was a pretty darn good definition. Oh, wow. <laughs> mm -hmm. So if I just walk up to you, we chat for a while. I find out you're interested in this field. And I say, so, Jafan, tell me what is real or, more commonly, what is reality? How do you begin to get a handle on that, given the appearance and the evidence that exists all around us? Yeah, I've um, found often that when individuals, and I've even done it myself, Aligned with some of these uh, spiritual ideas or these foundational truths, um, it is very easy at times for people to dismiss, ignore, or avoid many of the realities that many individuals on this planet are experiencing. So by no means do I approach this whole philosophy or foundational elements of what I call universal truths um, to ignore, avoid, or dismiss those individuals that struggle and or the suffering on this planet. Instead, am I able to possibly transcend that in a way to begin to recognize kind of that capital realness that is dwelling within all in terms of the energy that simply enables us to be, regardless of the circumstances? 
And then secondly, from a personal standpoint, am I able to recognize the role that I play in helping to assist and assemble that which I call my reality, utilizing many of those uh, tools that we've come into this earth equipped with in terms of our ability to direct and control our mind, our ability to uh, commit to choices, and our ability to commit to specific actions, all of which, from my perspective, act as these paintbrushes that we are utilizing on a day-to-day basis to assist in coloring the canvas that we call our reality or our life. Unfortunately, many of us, and I know myself is included in this, completely forget that we have the ability to assist in coloring this canvas that we call our reality. And we continue to use our thoughts, our choices, and our actions to recolor the canvas that we've been provided today, the same way that we've colored it yesterday or last week or last year or the last 10 years. But at any given time, we, so to say, could snap our fingers, come into alignment with that, which simply allows us to take this breath. And we're in alignment with it, whether we're aware of it or not. But utilize those tools that we've been provided to assist in creating or co-creating the reality that we experience individually and the reality we experience collectively. That's an interesting allegory. It sounds like you're saying that most of us are limited to uh, some sort of uh, paint by numbers creation, filling in the blanks of, of a template that's been handed to us when we have the ability to begin with a tabla rosa, a blank slate, a clean, open canvas, and put on that canvas virtually anything we can imagine. Every day, from my perspective, is an opportunity to at least recognize that we're provided with a blank canvas. We can direct and control ourselves, hopefully, whatever direction we desire. And uh, to the degree that we do that is the degree then to which the external world begins to reflect, hopefully, uh, what we are choosing to do within ourselves. So as I think you would say, Michael, um, our inner world tends to reflect the outer world or the outer world tends to reflect uh, what is taking place internally within ourselves. Both things are true, of course. Life is a two-way street. There is that which we project and that which appears to be done to us. What is the relationship of those two and which is primary? I think most of us, I'll just speak for myself, most of my life, I have felt like a victim of my life. And that's very easy to do. And the news, and I was a journalist for most of my life, is full of accounts of how life is being done to you. There's not much room, (laughs) not that many stories in what we call news about what people are contributing to the world that is new and fresh and exciting. And so I think it's important to understand that in this two-way give and receive yin and yang of life coming through us and out into the world and also seeming to be done to us, that the farmer is the primary side. What we radiate, what we emanate, what we, what we give to the world then changes the way we perceive what seems to be done to us. Yeah, it's fascinating to recognize the causal nature that we have for all the effects that show up in our life. I know you do a lot of uh, public speaking for businesses and corporations and all manner of institutions, but I'm particularly curious about how you take this to the business world and, uh, and, and make it practical and pragmatic for those folks. My guest is Jeff Ann Seeley. He's a transformational speaker a spiritual seeker and a personal development advocate and uh, our guest today at the Mystery School here on KPFK. We'll have more right after this. You're listening to KPFK. Van Dyke Parks here. You are listening to KPFK, listener-supported radio, where you can hear music, opinions, and points of view not often heard. But without your support, KPFK falls silent. Only you, the listener, can keep KPFK on the air. So join me in supporting Pacifica Radio in Los Angeles. Just go to kpfk.org and find out how you can help. It's a good thing to do. And this is the Ageless Wisdom Mystery School on KPFK in Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us and thanks for staying with us. Jeff Seely is our guest today and we're talking about personal and spiritual development and Jafan, I know that a lot of your work is taking these basic principles to business and sort of building a bridge between traditional principles of success and prosperity and these 
more esoteric values, uh, ethics, and morals. People who discuss success often do not address fulfillment. So you've got all this money, you got this big house, you got this nice car, you got all this stuff, the country club membership, whatever, great. But are you really happy? Are you really fulfilled? And I think there's a huge opportunity in the middle there for us to build bridges. And I'm wondering how you do that when you're called upon to come to business and make a presentation. Yeah, uh, really great question. It's fascinating to think about the whole process that I've been on to find my voice and take steps forward so that I am willing to share my voice. Um, I was living a few years back in Decatur, uh, Georgia, and just outside of Atlanta. And I remember sitting in my, my meditation station, which sounds a lot more elaborate than it actually was. It was literally just the corner of my, my bedroom. But uh, I sat down and, and I, I closed my eyes. And at this point, I was somewhat lost. I didn't know what to do. And I heard this insight. It wasn't a whisper from the heavens. It was more so just this flash of insight that encouraged me to move forward and share my voice. And I didn't know where to start. You know, I, I started reaching out to Center for Spiritual Living Communities, uh, Unity Churches, uh, Unitarian Universalist Churches, and then started branching into um, even middle schools, elementaries. I mean, give me an opportunity to speak. And um took a little bit of time to get the courage necessary to just continuously reach out. And this was about seven years ago. And, um, you know, things slowly started uh, moving forward. I remember showing up to one of my first engagements in a oversized suit. Um, I probably looked more like a, a clown than a, than a speaker. But uh, nevertheless, I showed up and I continued just to share and find ways to make my story uh, connect with people's stories because we all have a, a unique story, every single one of us. And can I perhaps bring some of the insights that I've gained forward with me so that I can assist another person while they're traveling down their unique journey? And um, that kind of culminated into a uh, eventually starting to reach organizations. And the way that that ultimately happened was finding a, a mentor who really saw something in me that I was unable to see within myself. Uh, he was, he's had his consulting business for 30 plus years. He's um, based in Salt Lake City, but from New Orleans. And he really brought me under his wing and really helped me find my voice even more so than uh, or, or already did. And this opened the doorway to speaking in a lot of organizations from NASA to the FDIC to many Fortune 500 organizations and academic institutions. And I found that all of those beginning building blocks in terms of speaking at these spiritual communities, there is this common thread that runs through it all in terms of assisting individuals uh, to show up and recognize not only their potential within themselves, their inherent worth, but beginning to recognize the inherent worth that dwells within the people around them. And this is an inner process. So as a speaker, as, a, as an, a consultant, somebody who enters into organizations, I can talk about things like diversity or inclusion, uh, cultural transformation, inclusive leadership, bridging differences across generations, uh, moving towards greater levels of performance. But it seems that all of these concepts really turn this mirror inward on the individual who I have the opportunity to be in front of and encourage them to begin to take these steps uh, deeper into their inner world so that they can recognize the barriers that prevent them from showing up more authentically, as you said, Michael, from finding fulfillment in the here and now, and ultimately start making this cultural shift in terms of what is taking place in their immediate surroundings by way of those individuals that they have the opportunity to interact with and see on a daily basis. So, it's been a, a really, really great journey and process, and I'm grateful that I, I said yes uh, to that little hint of insight that flashed within my mind uh, many years back. You're reminding me when uh, I began to do public speaking, leaving radio and going out on my own into uh, personal development work, I realized that public speaking was very different from being on the radio, even doing talk shows. and. So I needed to develop my chops. And uh, even today, if somebody asks me about this, I'll say, well, there are countless speaking opportunities if you go to service clubs. 
And I spoke to uh, untold numbers of Lions Clubs and Rotary Clubs and the Optimists. I didn't even know there was a group called the Optimists. And then there's a sorority called the Sore Optimists. And these are just people who are devoted to positivity. And I thought, well, you know, what a wonderful service organization. Or the Odd Fellows, uh, so-called because it's odd to be charitable, apparently and philanthropic, and uh, these were people who in past centuries would often bury the dead if they had no family and if if they had no means uh, as a service, and a a long history of that. And they have a sorority called the Rebecca's. So these people are always looking for speakers, and they'll usually buy you a lunch and maybe give you a coffee mug, and that's, that's, (laughs) that's about it. But... If you're smart, you'll take a little uh, portable recorder or, or your smartphone, record yourself, record everything that you do, and that's how you learn. That's how you develop your chops in this field. Most definitely. And I, I realized, you know, at first I would walk in and think that it's all about me, um, the person who's delivering the message. And what a short-sighted uh, vision that is. When I was able to start recognizing that everybody who I had the opportunity to speak in front of is bringing with them um, a mound of things that I'm unable to recognize or see, suddenly I started realizing that perhaps I could share something or say something or create something that would be impactful that they could take back with them and help resolve something that maybe they might be dealing with. And then it shifted from just uh, uh, emphasis on me, the speaker, to more so this uh, consciousness of service, where I'm not necessarily this person who's there to get patted on the back, but more so a vessel for something greater to speak through me, though I'm speaking, but something greater to speak through me and deliver a message in such a way that it might be able to be impactful and and be long lasting in assisting in the transformation of of any individual I have the chance to, to come into contact with. It really helps to like people, don't you think? That's probably fairly important. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean to be really fascinated uh, in how, gosh, the word majestic just came to mind, how magnificent, how, how magnanimous, <laughs> how magical people really are, even though most may not be aware of how wonderful they truly are. Yes, I totally agree. To be able to talk to people about that, it goes way beyond what we used to call motivational speaking. Right. Yeah, it's a, you know, and I, I often um, differentiate this whole concept of, of change or transformation. Um, my hope with anything that I do uh, is to bring about some level of transformation, not just helping somebody change. Change is what is happening here in Georgia right now with the seasons. It's moving from summer, it's going to be fall, then winter will be knocking on the door, spring, so on and so forth. So from that standpoint, it seems as if change is somewhat uh, temporary or reversible, meaning we can go back to our old way of operating or our habitual patterns if this new way of doing things does not work out. Transformation, on the other hand, seems to be irreversible. It's a a fundamental or foundational shift that happens from a, a, a personal standpoint at a conscious level that is like walking through a doorway that disappears once we step through it. It's uh, similar to a tree that's blossoming from a seed. You're not squeezing that tree back into that seed. It's uh, permanent and irreversible. So can I deliver or share something or provide some insight in such a way that it could lead to this conscious shift such that it literally transforms the way that individual shows up, whether externally or perhaps more importantly, internally within themselves? That's an interesting dynamic. The uh, spiral is the way I think of that because it has a seasonal, cyclical, round and around and around to it, but there's also a escalation. There's uh, moving up as well as going around. And I think in life, when we find ourselves asking ourselves, why is this happening to me again? Well, life has its cyclic nature, and we do go through these uh, periods of here we go again, you know, except... Can we pull on what we learned the last time we went through and make this a transcendent or transcendental a transformational kind of experience and enjoy the feeling that we may be moving around and around the mountain, but we're also moving up the mountain on this spiralic path? 
What are uh, some of your influences? When you look at your bookshelf, uh, who really grabbed you? Just off the top of your head, Jafan, uh, if you were going to compile a reading list here. Uh, you know, so I did mention that book, Course in Miracles, um, but I would say the one that really, really shook the foundation at a, at a young age for me was a book by Joseph Brenner called, um, it, it was called The Way to the Kingdom. And it really emphasized this whole concept of Christ consciousness. And uh, I think that that resonated with me most because I was in this seeking phase. And I only at that time was seeking in um, traditional religious approaches. So the Bible and things of that sort. And I always felt as if there was something that was greater in terms of, of consciousness, though it wasn't necessarily mentioned in, in the, the Bibles that I was reading, at least. And this whole concept of Christ consciousness just really aligned with me. So Joseph Brenner, The Way to the Kingdom, is a, a really, really powerful book from my perspective. Uh, obviously, The Science of Mind um, was a very influential and still continues to be an influential book in my experience. Uh, the Four Agreements uh, by Don Miguel Ruiz. Uh, Napoleon Hill, obviously, uh, was a really, really great, great book or a great author. Um, and then there's this book called Spiritual Growth. And I, I can't recall the, uh, the name of the, the author off the top of my, my head, but that was another book that was really, uh, instrumental in my, my growth and development and just really opened the doorway to ask deeper questions within myself to begin to come face to face with the preconceived ideas or the self image that I had about who I was, um, how I was showing up. And in direct alignment with that is a book that I would recommend to everybody perhaps my, my favorite book, and that is uh, Psycho-Cybernetics by Maxwell oh, 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 I'm surprised to hear you say that. You know, I found that in, in Atlanta, $1.87 at a used <laughs> bookstore. I was traveling on, the air, on an airplane and reading that book, and I, I felt like I, I stole something. I mean, it was just filled with insights that, that deeply resonated with me at the time and still, still, do, still does. Yeah, I remember encountering that book, and it was popular – Gosh, in the 1950s, I think, yeah. trying to remember just how old that is. But he was, a, as I remember the story, he was a plastic surgeon. Correct. Who was blown away by how a little nip here and a little tuck over there, these slight, a little nose bob or a tiniest little change you would make in somebody's appearance would have such a profound impact on their lives and he realized it was all psychological, and then he stumbled onto this cybernetic aspect of, well, the mind is basically you reap what you sow, right? Right, right. It's a thermostat. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Yeah. It, it's a cybernetic device that uh, you go where you look, you get what you expect, you reap what you sow. It's, life is such a self-fulfilling prophecy that it'll, it'll give you Whatever evidence you want, if you want to be cynical and negative and hostile and alienated and lonely, life will give you all kinds of evidence that you're absolutely right. I mean, like the ground, the earth is the great example. That's why I love Christ's allegory of reaping what you sow. Weeds, briars and brambles, seeds, they'll grow just as surely as roses and melons, right? Right, right. Earth doesn't care. It'll grow whatever you want to grow. Yeah, and that was something that resonated with me in the, the science of mind uh, philosophy or, or teaching was this whole idea of consciously sowing seeds into the subconscious or unconscious and watching the way in which it unfolds in your, you know, your, your, your reality or your life. And uh, every day we are walking around with these thoughts and continuously just planting them in the fertile soils of our, of our mind, of our heart, of our subconscious, of our, 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 our unconscious mind. And that which we continuously sow internally ultimately becomes to uh, it reflects externally. So uh, that's something that I'm I'm continuing to to dive into, and then finding myself having to admit 100 percent responsibility for the effects that I'm inviting, <laughs> sometimes unconsciously, into my life. I so love reading, and sometimes I'm concerned that the uh, high tech of the uh, smartphone or iPads and computers and Google and Internet. And I know reading is down. I've seen the studies. Reading is down by 25%. And 
so is attention span. It's becoming more and more difficult for overstimulated people to find the space that they need to concentrate for 15 or 20 minutes at a time and really get lost in a book. That's what you need to do, is not read one word at a time or a phrase at a time, but just get lost in it the way we get lost in a movie. And if you read well, and if it's a well-written book, it'll just devour you. You'll be consumed by it, and hours will pass. And gosh, I, I, I never thought there would be a time in my life where I'd be concerned about people wanting to read. <laughs> and libraries closing, and bookstores closing, and newspapers struggling to stay in business. And yet we do have self-publishing now. That's sort of a good thing. Anybody could write a book. Consequently, there are a lot of horrible, bad books out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. That is true. <laughs> but uh, you can publish your own book and get on Amazon and get some sales. And I think encouraging people to write books is also important. Writing a book forces you to think through ideas that you might only skate over if you didn't have to sit down and, and really compose these ideas and then that makes public speaking and teaching a lot easier. You already thought it out when you were writing the book. <laughs> right, right. You have, uh, you have, a, it's a book of poetry, I think you published, isn't it? Yeah, so I actually did go that, uh, that self-publishing route, not necessarily through Amazon, but uh, yeah, it's, it's entitled The Book of Essence, uh, Poems of Inspiration, Stories of Empowerment, and the Key That Unlocks the Greatest You. And I, uh, yeah, I put that together a few years back and found a book printer in uh, North Georgia or North Atlanta, had a few thousand copies printed up and then decided to drive around and speak at all these centers and, and share my book with as many people as possible. That's a good idea. It's a great calling card. Give it away. Here's my book. Right, right. And since we're talking about great books and books that have influenced us, let me mention that I put a reading list on my website at theagelesswisdom.com. It's up in the upper right corner. If you just click on reading list, you don't have to enter an email or log in or anything like that. Just go there and click on it. And Books that have influenced me over the years in two categories. I have one column that's personal development, and then the second column is spiritual development. There's a bit of overlap, of course, but... Pick and choose. These are the books that really changed my world, or some of them. So, Jafan, as we conclude this interview, and I've really enjoyed chatting with you today, what's on your horizon? Are, are you planning to write another book? Uh, are you working on a particular set of uh, classes, or what's on your to-do list? Yeah, yeah, that that infamous to do list, huh? Uh, <laughs> um, well, definitely, uh, there are some more more stories that are seeking to be uh, expressed through me. So, the process of writing a book is is underway, um, and then also, in addition to the speaking that I do, a lot of stuff with with organizations, which I'm really really appreciative uh, for and, and grateful of, um, is to assist people who want to begin speaking and sharing their their message. I've realized that if there's only one of me, I can only work with so many individuals, but I truly believe that we all have a voice. We all have, many of us have something that is very beneficial to others if we were willing to share. So finding ways in which I can support those people who are either aspiring to speak or are seasoned speakers, but looking to expand a little bit more. Those are two things that have really been knocking at my, my consciousness uh, to move towards creating, and then sharing with as many people as possible. As much fun as it is to speak live to groups of people, COVID has forced a lot of us to limit ourselves to online work. What's your feeling about that? Do you think you'll always have an online presence, or is your primary thrust going to be face-to-face -face once we get this COVID thing settled a little bit, moving out into the world? Uh, Michael, you know, 95% of all my engagements um, have been virtual. I'm in the midst of 25 engagements over the next two weeks, 100% virtual. Uh, of the 
upcoming engagements that I have. Two of them are in person. But I think that for organizations, it's I, they're starting to realize it's cost effective if there is a effective facilitator in a virtual setting. Uh, but I do think that as human beings, we do enjoy that. Many of us enjoy that face to face aspect. So I think that there's going to be a hybrid approach. And and honestly, I'm just uh, appreciative when I can share my voice and being aware, though, also of traveling and the impact that it has on the world around us. So I've, I've, I've enjoyed just popping over to my computer, turning it on and having conversations. That's a good point. Maybe we shouldn't be so quick to jump on the jet uh, if we don't really need to. Again, I, I, I love pressing the flesh and going out and looking people in the eye, but uh, you said a hybrid, some sort of blend of, of virtual and real world is what we should be looking for if we're going to be teachers or speakers or performers in a, a transformational field. I really appreciate what you do. And again, I'm excited and enthused that there are young men and women like yourself coming up, uh, interested in this material, attracted by this material, and um, making it available in as many ways as possible. I, I think this is what changes the world, not politics. Uh, not any institution. I don't think institutions, we have to have them, but I don't think that's the heart and soul of change. The heart and soul of change is the human heart and soul and the caring and the longing and your definition of reality at the top of the show, that, that life force, the breath, the spirit, the love, the light, however you want to refer to it. And I really appreciate you being with us today. How can folks... Uh, Find out more about you. Well, one one great thing about being named Jafon Seeley is I think I'm the only one in the, the world. So I think you even type Jafon, J-E-F-F-O-N in Google and, and I'll pop up. So uh, JafonSeeley.com or uh, just type me into one of those search things and you'll probably see see a face that hopefully resembles me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks very much. Best of luck. Let's stay in touch, okay? Definitely. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Michael. You're very welcome, and thanks for the good work that you're doing and inspiring others to do it. Teaching the teacher, train the trainer is what we used to call that, and I guess still do. Jafan Seeley, my guest today on The Mystery School on KPFK. Hey, thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in. Remember, we're podcasts forevermore on all podcast platforms, and we stream on demand at theagelesswisdom.com. Again, look for the reading list in the upper right corner. That's easy and fun. Nothing to sign into. I don't even need an email address from you. We do have a, uh, a newsletter for show notes if you want to keep track of upcoming guests. And you'll find that there as well. So as always, be gentle, love life, and take care of each other. From Los Angeles, this is Michael Benner on KPFK.